Good afternoon. My, my name is Pablo Heydrich. I teach here at uh, Carleton University, and Professor Laura McDonald has kindly invited me to, uh, to uh, help uh, chair this, uh, this uh, panel on the civil society perspectives on, uh, on NAFTA and maybe the, the future of uh, trade negotiations or the implementation of, uh, of these trade negotiations that have uh, recently concluded. Um, we're going to have uh, four presenters, and then uh, I'll um, try to have uh, help to have as many questions and, uh, and debate uh, as possible. We'll begin with uh, John Foster, and uh, who uh, will provide us a background on how this has been moving. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm sort of the ghost of Christmas past in this panel, uh, dealing with basically the period of the formation of the Trinational Alliance against NAFTA, which runs really from the mid to late 1980s forward uh, through into the um, Alliance, Hemispheric Social Alliance against the uh, Free Trade Agreement of the Americas. Uh, just in preliminaries, a couple of remarks. What I'm saying, talking about today is covered in part in this handy little book called Coalitions Across Borders by uh, Jackie Smith and uh, Joe Bandy. It's about 13, 14 years old. It contains uh, uh, chapters from Laura MacDonald and myself, among others, but it deals with a variety of organizing across borders, even solidarity with Polish pig farmers, which I had never thought about before. So I just recommend that. Maybe it's in your library. Uh, secondly, um, to note that this, this uh, presentation is based primarily on the experience of English Canadians. As Laura pointed out earlier, the history in Quebec, although parallel and often similar, has important nuances which are different, and I didn't attempt uh, to uh, cover those. Uh, the final preliminary is remember we are in the pre-internet, pre-email era here. Things were dependent on that wonderful antique instrument, the fax, and also interpersonal meetings, I think, were relatively more important than they are now, but I may be wrong about that. I think they are always important. Now, in terms of the context, Mexican civil society, I would say, in the period we were organizing, was on the upswing, or on an upswing. By 1994, forces which uh, became allied uh, in the Alianza Civica were sufficiently strong to organize a voluntary plebiscite across the federal district, demanding democratization. Remember, the federal district was, its government was basically appointed by the federal government uh, up until that time. The political atmosphere, the party political atmosphere in Mexico was particularly electric at this time, with the formation of the PRD, which has been mentioned, uh, the closely fought election of 88, and Guatemar Cardenas, from at that point the PRD, and his allies were seeking exterior linkages with Mexican-American communities in Chicago, San Diego, various places, and allies abroad as well as at home. We were just through the federal election of 1988 in Canada, which was fought over the bilateral free trade agreement with the US, and the majority of voters supporting po parties opposed to that agreement but the Mulroney conservative government re-elected and the agreement sustained. A number of civil society formations emerged in response to that initiative, including the Pro-Canada Network, which became the Action Canada Network, the Toronto Later Ontario Coalition Against Free Trade, co-chaired by Professor Marjorie Cohen from the National Action Committee on Status of Women and myself, and these groups were aware of the coming initiatives to expand that agreement to include Mexico. However, most of us thought that process would take 10 years. We thought we had time. One nuance that distinguishes the 1980s from the 1990s 
was that when a few of us visited Washington in the mid-1980s to seek understanding of Canadian apprehensions about the FTA negotiations, we found very few in the halls of Congress and very few among research groups and NGOs who connected with our fears whatsoever. As far as they were concerned in general, the presupposition was that free trade was the progressive road. What were we scared of? Meanwhile, um, a, a MacArthur uh, Foundation funded initiative called US-Mexico Dialogos brought together Mexican social actors together with US and ultimately some Canadian counterparts, not focused on trade per se, but through much of what I'm talking about, they provided um, convening power when activists from the three countries could meet, clarify understandings, and debate. Dialogos had a catalytic effect on this process. Now, in terms of initiative, I want to underline the importance of Canadian initiative in the formation of the Trinational Alliance. In September 1988, before the election, a working group of, of the decades-old Latin American working group, or LOG, called Common Frontiers, organized a visit of three Canadians to the Macula, and um, looking at implications of what the free trade agreement might mean in terms of Macula production, the whole discussion about runaway plants and so on. They also sought out contacts with Mexican worker organizations and set out to find ways to work together. This new organization involved several unions, NGOs, ecumenical formations, the National Action Committee, the Center for Policy Alternatives, uh, and uh, the uh, Canadian Environmental Law uh, Association, and set out to monitor developments, mandate specific research, raise Mexican voices in Canada, and vice versa, and initially brought to Canada Jose Luis Canchola from one of the groups working with the migrant and macula questions in Tijuana, and Adolfo Aguilar Zinzer, uh, who at that point I think was a journalist, but later became a senator and ambassador to the UN for Mexico. We organized a twin organization which was initiated as uh, Fronteras Comunes in Mexico, and it later gave way to the formation of the Mexican network uh, in front of free trade. Now, in June 1990, President Bush announced the commencement of bilateral negotiations with Mexico. But that year was also key to the organization of civil society. Two events in Mexico City in 1990 were decisive in establishing the shape of civil society alliances against NAFTA. The Mexican opposition party, the PAN, basically the right-wing opposition in Mexico, backed a major trade policy event in downtown Mexico City, organized uh, considerably by Professor Gu Teresina Gutierrez Hase, who some of you may know. Ten Canadian proponents of the free trade agreement were invited to debate with ten critics, many of whom came from um, opposition um, NGOs. And uh, they looked at the, the dimensions, critical elements of the bilateral FTA, in order to see implications for any new agreement and try to relate uh, to, where Mexico, to the interests of Mexican society, issues like uh, provision of social services, trade union rights, et cetera. And following that event, Common Frontiers Allies organized a bilateral encuentro for 30 Canadians and 60 Mexican participants hosted by the Independent Trade Union Federation, the FAT. A log staff person resident in Mexico assisted with contacts with the latter. Now, there was an interesting nuance about that. The issue was whether or not, at that point, to engage Americans in such an encounter. And it was felt that that would change the nature of the debate considerably. So it was agreed, really, I think, at Canadian behest, that first of all, we establish bilateral relations between Canada and Mexico and invite the Americans later. And that was what happened. In November of that year, Mexican and Canadian representatives visited Washington, hosted by key US environmental labor rights development NGOs and policy research centers, 
the U.S. Alliance for Responsible Trade emerged in early 1991. The Encuentro, Canadian-Mexican Encuentro, amplified by U.S. participation later, became the pattern for ensuing years, commencing with an event in 1991 in Waxapec. And this would involve dozens of, uh, of activists and NGO and uh, labor representatives. Following uh, the Encuentro and the Wastapec meeting, there were basically two streams of trinational practice in what emerged as the Trinational Alliance Against Free Trade, though never formally incorporated as such. One level was the pursuit of the negotiation by groups of activists following each stage of the negotiations in each of the three countries, seeking intelligence about the details, analyzing implications, publicizing what was a, up until then a very opaque practice of intergovernmental uh, bodies. In October 1991, around 150 activists met in Zacatecas, hammered out a joint analysis and an initial declaration, and that kind of practice uh, continued. The second level was that Mexican civil society primarily hosted several trinational conferences, sizable events with several hundred participants in Mexico City, in each case organizing sectoral working groups, sharing policy, and working out joint positions. This is important in terms of coalition organizing, I think, uh, because networks essentially needed living targets. The existence of an official project, the NAFTA, provided the alliance with a magnificent shared target for five years, one that possessed specific actors, a sequence of political moments of institutionalization that became the focus of campaigns. The necessity of responding to the next negotiating site, the next issue on the official agenda, the next opportunity for reinforcing concern in Congress, Parliament, or the Mexican public gave form to the alliance. It did so by forcing a certain discipline and routine on the organizers involved and by provoking a certain set of strategies and tactics and by demanding ongoing substantive and tactical clarification by the various partners. Supporting this engagement were four regional coalitions, the Rezo Quebecois, the Red Me Mexicano, uh, um, uh, the Canadian coalition, and what ultimately became two coalitions in the United States, um, collaborating um, office to office, essentially through one or more staff person and fax machine. Well, the NAFTA process continued, as I say, for about five years. The U.S. took a further initiative, hosting the first summit of the Americas in Miami in 1994. Those who were engaged in the NAFTA process had to initiate, if they wished, of course, new links and organizations uh, with organizations, uh, al possible allies, uh, throughout the hemisphere. That uh, led to a, meeting, a key meeting at the Belo Horizonte Brazil trade meeting in 1997, which led to the formation of a broader alliance, the Hemispheric Social Alliance, which began to embody many of the same characteristics of the Trinational Alliance. This further process benefited from some of the impacts of the Trinational experience. The political impact of the coalitions engaged in the trade battles has never met the hopes and expectations of participants. Yet there were marks of success, some of which have been referred to in earlier presentations, uh, in affecting the official agenda. One, achievement of limited but increasing transparency in the negotiations process. Achievement of recognition and at least marginal participation for civil society actors in consultation in all three countries. This was something unknown in Mexico until the organization of uh, the, the Trinational Alliance. The sidebar labor and en en environmental agreements, the several year hiatus in US fast track authority, 
and the release of texts, limited consultation, and introduction of a civil society committee relating to the FTAA process. In conclusion, the formation of the Trinational Alliance and various related links represented a change in the posture and perspective of many Canadian actors. Tony Clark, former chair of the Action Canada Network, noted the shift from international, let's say, development work that was doing something for third world countries to a situation where our only hope lies in identifying those mutual interests that we both have in common. Out of that, some real solidarity is developed. Secondly, there was a continuing relationship with Mexican politics. Guatemoc Cardenas, defeated candidate for the presidency, uh, came to Canada at least twice, in one case for a round table on Parliament Hill on April 17, 1991, hosted uh, by CLC head Bob White, and in another case in Vancouver, as I recall, for the BC Federation of Labour. This was something, uh, again, pretty well unknown when you have a leading Mexican politician engaging with Canadian labour and civil society. Some other contributing elements to uh, the relative success or limited success of the uh, trinational. Some academies provided space and more not only to Dialogos but to other initiatives. The Center for U.S.-Mexican Relations at the University of California, San Diego, the University of Chicago, the University of Wisconsin, and there were academics, some of whom you might recognize, who contributed analysis as well. Jonathan Fox from the West Coast, Catherine Thorup, who authored the Rand uh, Corporation study on the auto industry long before we were talking about it, and Ian Robinson. Secondly, related to uh, um, research contribution, the research personnel of the major US unions and those in the ecumenical formations like the late John Dillon of Gadfly were particularly useful in focused research that related to alliance issues. A few key journalists were very helpful, thinking particularly of Luis Hernandez and David Brooks associated with La Jornada, and as well as the people associated with Sencos, the Mexican uh, NGO analyzing uh, the Mexican press from a, essentially a political econ economic point of view. Funding was never extensive but often decisive, and in this I would credit uh, unions who supported fact-finding visits, uh, NGO support of volunteers like CUSO volunteers working in, Latin, in Central America, and small Christian initiatives like the Frontier Internships out of uh, the US. The Canadian contribution to the formation of the Trinational Alliance did not fall whole from the heavens. It was built on a decade or more of political economic research and experience in organizing north-south, south-north visits of human rights, trade union, civil society, and religious volunteers, and the knowledge of potential partners and allies which built up over that time, many of them in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, John, for <clears throat> Thank you, John, for your presentation. Um, after this, we will have a presentation from Sujata Day, who is a, who is a lead trade campaigner uh, for the Council of Canadians. Thank you. So I'm going to talk um, about the environment in, in NAFTA and what we did during the, uh, the talks. Um, first of all, I, I think it's really important to, to bring up, first of all, why this actually matters. Why are we even talking about the environment? I mean, we know that there's a global crisis. Um, it's the International the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has basically said we have 12 years in order to limit climate change to 1.5 degrees. Um, so within that context, um, it's really important to, to, to talk about trade because trade has a, very, a large impact on the environmental crisis. Um, it, increased trade means that there's more greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it also means increased trade means that um, companies can leave um, jurisdictions and subtract themselves from regulations. So it's very important within, within NAFTA that we have a strategy of how do we deal with the environment and, not, and a strategy that deals with the current existential crises. 
Um, there's always um, examples, for example, in, in, in the original NAFTA, there was ways in which uh, regulations were changed so that um, companies from the U.S. could go to Mexico and produce lead batteries where there was less, less um, lower legislation. So trade is not um, environmental ne neutral. Um, so it's very important because we, we there was discussed that uh, the, the difference between national interests and international interests, and we within uh, trade agreements we have very very binding. Um, and mechanisms to deal with problems around trade. We have a race towards trade agreements and we make sure that those things count. But when it comes to environmental um, agreements, we don't have the same urgency and nor do we have the same amount of mechanisms to, to, to basically enforce what we're doing on the environmental level. So within NAFTA, very NAFTA in the NAFTA years, we saw um, a lot of people would talk about what in Canada that we changed from a, a basically uh, from, to from a petrol from a, um, an industrial economy towards more of a petroleum based economy within the NAFTA years. Um, Jim Stanford, who was with, with Unifor, talks a lot about how um, at one point in 1999, um, value added industries represented 60% of the sector, and now they're at 40% of the sector. So as we are, are moving towards a petroleum economy, that becomes much harder to bring in other industries. So and and to have uh, and we become more dependent on that, and that is very important um, when we're talking about. Um, <laughs> the First Nations who are often on um, the, the front lines of, of those um, uh, of, of projects having to do with the, the, um, the environment. So because of this, we had um, decided that we were going to concentrate um, a lot on, on NAFTA. So we made a series of recommendations um, with Maud Barlow wrote a report, our, our chairperson Maud Barlow, who was you know, originally in the first NAFTA fight, um, wrote a series of, 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 of um, recommendations. Um, we also did more than that. We sent out about 30,000 um, letters to um, the Prime Minister and to uh, Freeland. We also put up a, an ad um, on, the, on the national CBC. Um, we talked um, to many politicians. We had a, a series of trinational reports um, that we did to reinforce our, our recommendations. So which weren't all, all on the environment, but I'll just talk about the ones that were about the environment. Um, the first one was to eliminate Chapter 11. Um, as you know, Chapter 11 is the, the, the mechanism which gives um, corporations the right to sue states over um, regulations that could get in the way of their profit. Um, there's been a lot of research on how um, some, how two-thirds of the uh, cases against Canada have been about environmental uh, legislation. Recently, we just saw that Bill Kahn got a $7 million settlement for the quarry in, in Nova Scotia that it, it was that refused by the, the um, Nova Scotia government. So this is a very important um, issue that we wanted to bring up. Um, and we also did some polling as well. You can see that um, Canadians were, not inform were very much in favor of getting rid of uh, Chapter 11. The other issue that we tried to deal with was energy proportionality. And that um, was a, a, a clause within NAFTA which um, forces Canada to export a certain percentage of its energy to the United States. Um, Mexico decided that they didn't want to be part of this, um, but Canada has this, this clause within um, the original NAFTA. Um, and we had commissioned um, research by Gordon Laxer, Professor Gordon Laxer is Professor Emeritus at uh, University of Alberta. We did a joint um, uh, paper with the Sierra Club in United States and Greenpeace Mexico to talk about how the environment was affected in, um, in um, NAFTA and specifically on energy proportionality. Um, we also, with this research, said that with energy proportionality, um, we would be producing uh, twice ca of Canada's current emissions and about 12 times greater our emissions target um, for 2050 as set by the G8 in 2009. So this was a very important um, clause that we also needed, wanted to get rid of. <clears throat> We also um, dealt with water. Um, water is a good in the annex of the original NAFTA. Um, what that means is that it needs to be 
it can we cannot put um, limitations. So if we were trying to um, prevent, for example, bulk, bulk water exports. Right now, all the um, provincial and federal le legislation doesn't um, allow it, but if it were allowed, um, there's also another um, thing, which is a proportionality of goods within the original NAFTA, and that would say that we would have to also maintain those proportions of, of water um, within that. So, that. so that was another issue that we were also working on. Um, within water, um, they basically got rid of the proportionality clause in the new NAFTA, so that that doesn't exist. Um, they have a side letter on water, so they tried to listen to us at some level, basically saying water in its natural form is, is protected. However, what happened is that um, water, once it's commodified, uh, either through, you know, it's sold as, as water, um, as a bulb, bottled water, for example, or as a service, it is a commodity and is it effective to uh, market uh, mechanisms within NAFTA. And um, the results of the ne negotiation, basically proportionality was taken out of the, uh, of the NAFTA. We think that's a, a, a very good win, um, that this um, proportionality clause was taken out. Um, ISDS was also gone um, between Canada and the US and Canada and Mexico. Um, so this is a major win for Canadian um, pu public policy and environmental policy. Um, however, we have to remember that this is not a, a, a continued win. For example, um, it exists between Mexico and the U.S. Um, still, um, and especially in a reduced form. It also does um, exist between um, government contracts in its full form with Mexico. Um, what happened is that um, with the AMLO government, um, he wanted to make um, bring back a lot of the privatization and relook at some of the contracts that were given to private companies within Mexico. And basically, so they were at a point in the negotiation, they were gonna get rid of, uh, of ISDS for Mexico. Then American oil companies went, whoa, 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 we have contracts in Mexico and we have a new government here, we, we can't do this. So ISDS was brought back in for telecommunications um, and for uh, energy sector and for certain government pro projects within, within Mexico. The other thing we have to also note is that at the same time, um, here's, um, while we were getting rid of uh, ISDS between Mexico and Canada, we had another trade agreement that came in, which is a CPTPP. So effectively, we still have um, ISDS between Mexico and Canada through another agreement that we just adopted. Um, my analysis is that perhaps for, for Canada, where we have, we have more mining and other interests within Mexico and other countries, so for that, for that um, you, Canadian corporations are very grateful to keep ISDS, whereas within the American context, it was, it was less interesting for us. But, and there's still a, a legacy period of three years, um, so there's three years after the deal comes into effect that people can still use ISDS. However, this is a major policy win for Canadians because we are the most sued in, in NAFTA. We are the most sued developed country in the world in the ISDS, so this is a, a major win. The other part of NAFTA, though, that in the one hand, we have all these sort of gains in, in NAFTA, but on the other hand, we have sort of, um, what we, what we say at the Council of Canadians is that there is, it's a bit like one step back for forward, two steps backwards. So on the one hand, we have this open door policy where you know, corporations could basically sue over policies, and that's been gone. But now there's all these insidious ways through the back door that um, com companies can, can influence our, our, our regulations and environmental regulations. So the one thing, um, and I know that the CCPA and Stuart True has done a lot of research on this, is, is regulatory cooperation. And so basically regulatory cooperation is like the back door for corporations. Um, they've been trying to do it through all these different agreements, but they finally got it, and they have it binding in, in, this, in this agreement. Um, so basically interested persons, um, corporations, get a, a notice of when regulators are trying to regulate. Um, they're <coughs> invited to be part of this process. Um, they're invited to be part of OPAC committees that that meet, um, it's often um, in their history of regulatory cooperation, these are not civil society or people who are there, they're mostly industry people. Um, it puts uh, onerous um, burden on regulators to defend their regulations to say yes, in fact, they, these, they really need to do this, we couldn't do another, we couldn't actually do another way of regulating. Um, it requires that all, all regulations be science-based, so that means when you're regulating you can't deal with you know other considerations. It also puts the burden on the regulator to prove that, okay, we have to prove the science, not the corporation that has to prove that, you know, we, this is not harmful, it's the regulator that has to prove that there is a harm. So it, it definitely puts a break on trying to, to, to put regulations. 
Um, the other thing is that it often will, what we talk about is uh, regulatory harmoni harmonization, where all the regulations are, are all even and corporations could just jump over the border, you know, and everything's same, you know, and that's the, 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 the goal. However, often that is about uh, lowering standards and going to the lowest de common denominator. It's not necessarily about increasing um, standards. So when we talk about issues like GMOs or glyphosate or health labeling or uh, rules on food inspections, um, cigarette labeling, safety rules, these are all um, now put in this back door where corporations can, can game those type of uh, regulations which have a huge um, impact on the environment. So they don't have it through the one door, but they've got it through the back door. Um, the other um, part is the uh, environment chapter. Um, much has been discussed about uh, an environment chapter and it, it was you know, a separate side agreement, but then it was brought into um, the actual um, uh, agreement and it's very much the old TPP style language. Um, as we often say, there, there's absolutely no mention in the agreement at all of climate change or global warming or the Paris Accord. Um, and it seems like that is a bit retrograde in, in, in the sense that if we're talking about international agreements um, and, and this century, it seems like not that's sort of the elephant in the room, that you, how can you even talk about the environment without talking about climate change? Um, it's also been mentioned there's very, very weak enforcement. You can only enforce the, um, the, the agreement when it has to uh, change uh, trade flows. Um, so it has to be dealing with investment. Um, it has a, very, um, a few um, uh, multilateral agreements that are mentioned in it. Um, you know, on pollution, on endangered species, on ozone, on marine pollution, um, but many of those are not um, very, very little enforceable language. Um, often even um, with Sierra Club has mentioned that it's also gone backwards from the original NAFTA. They've taken out multilateral agreements that were there in the original NAFTA. So basically it's a 1970s agreement for you know, a, a 21st century problem. Um, other problems um, for us, um, the supply management, um, um, the in inroads that the U.S. will get into our market. Um, oh, good, I'm, I'm actually not over time. Um, so the inroads in, in terms of us will, will mean that um, in Canada, the Council of Canadians and many allies um, campaigned to make sure that bovine growth hormone um, was not um, produced in Canada. And as you might know, um, that's something that we, they're, they're used in dairy to make milk production increase. Um, and it's something that is very, very harmful on cows. Um, Health Canada decided that at the end that they were going to not license it. So that doesn't mean it can't come in. It means that no one here can use it. So with supply management um, being affected, that means we're going to have imports of um, U.S. dairy with, that use this bovine growth hormone, which is going to be difficult for us in terms of health reasons. It's also going to be very difficult on farmers because they're not only competing with these big agro companies who are coming in, they're also competing with um, farmers who are producing at a larger scale with bovine growth hormone. Um, other problems, we're also looking, um, there's another side letter on energy, which is talking about how we're going to regulate and how we're going to bring together, you know, pipelines, make it much easier for, for, for pipelines to challenge reg regulations, also parts of the agreement um, which make it cheaper for pipelines to come in. So there's a large, large talk about energy um, integration within the Americas, and, and that could be very problematic. Um, we're also going to be commissioning research on, um, there has been many attempts um, it, to get into complicated weeds. We have, um, disciplines on crown corporations and state-owned enterprises in the agreement. So basically the, what it says is that um, corporations are, you know, basically anything owned by the state has to be as much done to the market as possible. But however, in the agreement, we decided that our Trans Mountain Corporation, well, they don't have to be part of that. We as a state can protect um, Trans Mountain from, from those market liberalizations. So that shows a serious um, um, policy priority of, of this government, and that's something that needs to be questioned. So basically, um, what we're saying that within the U.S. debate is, is it's going to be very interesting. All the leading um, U.S. Um, environmental groups like 350, like Sierra Club, like Greenpeace, are all basically saying not to ratify the agreement in the U.S., especially in its current form. So um, what we're worried about this here in Canada, 
um, where we tend to have less of a debate or we tend to follow the U.S. debate, um, there's going to be a rush to say, okay, this is the best agreement we can get. Um, you can't do anything basically against the U.S. who has all the power, that we have to basically take this as it is and there's nothing we can possibly do. We're not reopening this agreement. But we're, what I'm saying is that the rush to um, ratify such an important agreement is not really healthy. We need to have a democratic debate in Canada. We need to wait and, and, and take the emphasis, all the, um, all the push from the Democrats that we have here and use it to get a, another, a much more progressive agreement uh, and because we can do much better on, when it comes to the environment uh, within NAFTA. Thank you. Many thanks, Suyata, for your presentation. Um, after her, we're going to have a presentation by Angelo Di Caro, who is the who's Unifor's strategic research and policy uh, analyst. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I, I've left your note there with the timing no, with Suyata. No, no, here. you can't have it. You can't have it back. Um, so good afternoon. Yeah. Good. Oh no. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak here uh, today, and thank you to Laura uh, for the invitation. Um, I think uh, the, the past two years, uh, as I'm sure others in the room and on the panel for sure can attest to, has been a real whirlwind on trade, uh, to say the least. Uh, I think uh, I've been permanently scarred by this experience, uh, as I still have a recurring dream where I'm on the phone battling the static, uh, trying to explain to my grandmother how NAFTA's auto rules of origin work. And then I wake up in a panic, and I've had this dream twice. It's a bizarre. Um, the saga of the USMCA or the KUSMA or NAFTA 2.0, whatever you want to call it, is, uh, is far from over. That's clear, and Sujata mentioned that a bit. And like, like most things with the uh, Trump administration, trying to figure out uh, a plan or what's around the next corner is often a bit of a crapshoot. Uh, but I think there's value uh, in this panel and us reflecting on our experiences and engagement as civil society on trade for the past couple of years because, at least in my view, there's been some notable changes in how uh, collectively we are talking about trade and, and how we are acting on trade. Uh, I was asked to comment on the role of unions as civil society actors and the role we've played in shaping the North American integration agenda as well as our role in NAFTA renegotiation and our expectations over the coming months. And I'll try to do that, uh, and uh, I will focus uh, a bit on the labor piece. I know that others have talked about it, and also a bit on the auto piece. Um, uh, I guess what I want to do is offer a few general observations, three, three general observations that are drawn from my personal experience from more than about 10 years of direct activism on trade. And also, I guess the relatively extraordinary and unique access that Unifor had and I had in the NAFTA renegotiation process these past years. So uh, I'll, I'll start with a first observation. And it's that it, it, there does seem to uh, appear that there's a different narrative that's forming on free trade that is unlike what we've experienced uh, in the past. And I just want you to indulge me a bit just for a little bit of history. Um, although I, th I really enjoyed John's uh, presentation on, on that. This is more of a, a union kind of history. I remember reading, I never got to work with him, but I knew him. I uh, read Bob White's uh, book, Hard Bargains. If you haven't read it, it's fantastic. Um, and it, it says right, right towards the end, in the fall of 1985, that the Mulroney government invited trade unions through the Canadian Labour Congress to participate in a committee on the proposed Canada-US free trade agreement. That committee's mandate wasn't to determine, which was the big question at the time, whether Canada should pursue free trade uh, or not. And, and again, you re reflect on the two different time periods we're talking about here. Today, I mean, not only does Canada have you know, more than a dozen free trade agreements, uh, infinite number of tax, bilateral tax treaties and FIPAs and other free trade instruments. At that time, this was groundbreaking stuff and there was, we were at a fork in the road. We were deciding what path we were gonna take. And so um, that committee that, was, that we were being asked to participate in wasn't about that question. And in Bob's words, in the book, it was about how far free trade should go and how fast. And that clearly offside with where the union movement was at at the time. The CLC uh, rightly rejected the invite. And they proceeded to mount what I think was the most impressive counter campaign against corporate investor privilege agreements. I, I want to patent my own acronym in the world of trade, the KIPAs, the KIPA. 
free trade agreements in Canada that we've ever seen, and I think we've ever seen since. Uh, there's a poster on the wall at the Unifor offices. Um, it, it's a, a poster of a May 15th, 1993 anti-NAFTA anti rally that was held on Parliament Hill. Uh, and this was prior to Photoshop, so I trust what I'm seeing in this photo. Uh, there were more than uh, 100,000 people, by some accounts, a quarter of a million people standing outside center block protesting NAFTA, which was absolutely remarkable. And I'll even go so far as to say almost unfathomable today uh, that we would be able to pull out those kind of numbers. That Canada USFTA and the subsequent NAFTA battle uh, was ultimately lost. Uh, but the principled resolve to campaign against these agreements and what they stood for, it did sustain for years to come, as, as it should have. Although certainly the passage of NAFTA was a significant body blow to the whole spirit of, of countering uh, uh, these free trade agreements. In the years to come, there was far less public resistance over subsequent and smaller bilateral trade deals that uh, came online with Israel, with Chile, and with Costa Rica, and then at the same time, as I mentioned, other free trade instruments being concocted like FIPAs and uh, investment treaties, uh, bilateral sector uh, agreements like open skies agreements for air tra transit, and, and many others. At that time, unions, like other groups in civil society, we were trying to fry up a lot bigger fish uh, at the time around the WTO mill millennial round of negotiations, the MIA, the OAS, and so forth. The next big uh, series of bilateral trade deals surfaced in the mid-2000s that included Colombia, that also included South Korea. But by this point, popular opposition to free trade that was stoked in the 90s, it had really all but vanished, uh, and that's probably the subject of another panel that we should do. Uh, and unions, at least, I can speak for us, we, we were very much tackling these new agreements in different and I would say less meaningful coalition building ways and usually through the lens of very narrow and specific issues that were targeted on, on vulnerable sectors. So reflecting back, the mainstream view that evolved, I think, in that time period was that A, free trade was a net positive for Canada. That was signed, sealed, and delivered after 1993 or even 1998. And as much as self-interested unions uh, protested, free trade was still presumed to be good for workers. And under Stephen Harper, I think there was an intentional resurgence of bilateral free trade. We were about to embark on a very ambitious era of free trade since the 1990s. But at the time, unions' views weren't being solicited. And we were generally frozen out of the discussions. We would rarely receive invites to any consultations. We were left to build counter-narratives, warning of free trade, not as a popular movement, but more as kind of a resistance struggle happening on the margins. And then the first great crisis of capitalism struck, and it wreaked havoc on working people around the world. It was like a dumpster fire that was fueled by latent workplace social and status anxieties that had been festering for decades, including because of these free trade agreements. And it was a crisis that was made worse by these boneheads doing neoliberal policy who were gutting public services, deepening economic crises and inequality, and they were trying to put out the fire by spraying it with gasoline. Uh, today, I think there's a growing dissonance in the mainstream view of free trade and globalization, and it's being driven by disaffected working people, and I was really encouraged to hear Chris talk about that on the morning panel. There is no natural consensus in this opposition, except that the status quo right now is untenable, and that free trade has failed working people. Not necessarily a, a, a narrative that says free trade has failed, but that workers and by extension other social conditions of trade, they have clearly been left out of the equation. We can say this now without being laughed out of a room, uh, despite who, who's there with us, which is a remarkable change over 10 years. Um, I'd like to think that at least in North America, unions and our partners have helped seed that, that counter narrative over the past 30 years through very sustained and incisive criticism. And as a result, we engaged in a long-awaited NAFTA renegotiation, and it happened in some ways through a different lens uh, than I think we had, had done it when it first came out. It's a very messy and distorted frame, that's for sure. It's creating some incredibly difficult and uncomfortable conversations, especially among union members, which has a tinge sometimes of racism and a tinge of, of pro-Trump support 
but this is the reality that we face. Nevertheless, though, it's a fracture in the mainstream trade debate, uh, and it's something that social movements have been waiting for, and it might be the most significant development in the broader continental integration agenda so far. And so this is the first point I want to make. The second is that the experience we've had with NAFTA renegotiation is changed our expectations of engagement on trade agreements. Uh, folks in this room might have a different historical experience, but this was the first time I can recall a concerted effort by federal officials to openly discuss negotiating proposals and strategies with unions in advance of and during talks. Unifor, uh, like other unions, we were part of a group, uh, a multi-stakeholder group called the Labor Consultation Group, and it was being led by ESDC. Through the forum, officials gave us briefings on negotiating texts. They invited us to provide input and make suggestions and provided us updates as talks were going on. On top of this, it felt to me there was a far greater degree of open dialogue with other officials throughout the bureaucracy and lead negotiators. It was certainly not on the same level as what we were having at the labor consultation group, but we were able to easily get captive audience meetings with negotiators. And again, I don't know how effective they were all the time, but very different from what we experienced under the previous government. In the case of auto and rules of origin, we developed a very close uh, technical working relationship with the folks at Global Affairs. And it was through this relationship and this platform that we had actually proposed concepts like labor value content that tied market access to things like factory wages, which is a model that I, I, you know, I'm not sure exists in many other free trade or bilateral, bilateral trade arrangements. And it was a proposal that was originally scoffed at and we were kind of literally laughed at, but then became an interesting compromise position as the talks kind of came to their conclusion. The final text on auto is very complicated. I can talk about this another time or through questions. And it does have its challenges, but um, it, it's not as ambitious as we had hoped. Um, but there are other details being worked out in the series of uniform regulations being developed. And still, we have a voice at that table, and we are still being consulted on how best to do this. The, the concept was never about bring the jobs back, as I think a lot of the messaging and the rhetoric was. In our view, this model was intended to solidify a North American production footprint and disincentivize corporations from easily just moving work across borders. Um, it was enough to prompt at least uh, whether or not we, you know, we're fully supportive of where we've landed or not. I think it's better than what we had and it's, it's interesting. But it was certainly enough to prompt our, uh, quote, friends at the Fraser Institute, those great folks, uh, to, who suggested after the details came out that clearly, quote, clearly for the auto sector, the USMCA is a step backwards to the managed trade days of the 1960s, hearkening back to the Canada-US auto pact. That is absolutely ludicrous to think that that's what's happened here. And that's clearly not the case. But it was definitely a different outcome and one that, in our view, will complement our ongoing work to advance a national automotive strategy. And it's one example, I'll say, of our direct and strategic engagement paying off to some degree and having a positive effect. Um, now, what degree that engagement is sustained is still an open question. Our engagement with trade officials is really not formalized in any specific way, unlike what happens in the US and the EU to some extent and is very much subject to changing political headwinds and shifting political priorities. Maybe the only exception to that is that uh, under the CETA agreement, we are participating in a domestic advisory group, which has its own more structured kind of formal nature to it. It would not surprise me in the least, given how loose this relationship is, uh, that unions will quickly return to the bitter cold wilderness of trade policy uh, under a different government, um, uh, especially with our experience with the conservatives. The last observation I'll make is that any meaningful advancement in trade alternatives, I think requires a greater degree of transnational cooperation in civil society. The cross-border solidarity work that was done, and Angela mentioned it, among unions, including with independent Mexican labor organizations, I thought was quite fruitful. Um, together, uh, Canadian, US, Mexican organizations, we really lit fire to the prevailing notion, especially among small C conservative politicians, that Na NAFTA has been nothing but good for Mexican workers. We effectively framed Mexican labor reform 
and union democracy as not only a principled matter, but a matter that would benefit all industrial workers across North America. There was a relentless stream of news articles and stories about Mexican state oppression during the NAFTA talks that was magnified as a result of the NAFTA talks. And I think of those miners that were shot and killed uh, at, that, at that gold mine, Canadian old gold, gold mine, is absolutely atrocious, but had a lot of oxygen because of the NAFTA going on. And it helped build momentum for labor reform language in the text. And that was captured, as others have mentioned, in a special annex to the labor chapter. Uh, we may find it difficult to sustain uh, an effective and meaningful popular solidarity movement among workers in North America outside of the NAFTA spotlight. I know that Unifor and the steel workers and others are doing a very good job trying to forge these ties in a meaningful way, but it is way too easy to fall back now on our modes of self-interest, the combative forces of free market competition, and then the desire to preserve jobs, and we're, we're grappling with this right now with General Motors in Oshawa, uh, which has become a very challenging fight for us. There are a lot of questions around the new NAFTA labor chapter, including on long-standing enforceability questions. And I'll tell you, uh, I, I'm, I'm with that 100%, but to ever think that progressives on questioning NAFTA would say that what we need is to strengthen the enforceability mechanisms of arguably the worst trade agreement that we've ever had is remarkable because that's what this will require. Um, that chapter 31, the new dispute settlement mechanism, has to be reformed to fix the loopholes that the Democrats are championing again. So there's a bit of a, of a talking out of both sides of our mouth on this one, and something we have to be, I think, very careful about of what we're actually uh, proposing. And coupled with that are open questions about how Mexican workers are able to take advantage of some of these new openings to secure proper collective bargaining agreements uh, governed by democratically elected union representation and under the annex and also the reform legislation that is working through, there will be a four-year time clock on contract votes having to be uh, voted on by Mexican labor. How we assist our Mexican comrades in this struggle, how we support them in those inevitable fights which have started already, and referencing the Matamoros dispute happening uh, in Mexico, that, I think, is going to be the true test of, of lasting solidarity that will come out of this experience in the USMCA negotiation. And so if we're able to contextualize these struggles that are hopefully going to happen within a reasoned criticism of the new agreement, this might actually, if done right, uh, be a source of fresh air uh, in support of the development of progressive trade alternatives uh, that we have long needed and long called for uh, among the union movement. And as this mainstream uh, narrative of free trade continues to shift, and in some cases, in, in our favor. Thanks. Of course. Many thanks, Angelo. Um, well, now we have uh, Nidia Ibrahim, who is the coordinator for the Trade Justice Network. Thank you, Nidia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Laura and the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Um, as Pablo mentioned, I'm the coordinator of the Trade Justice Network, which is a coalition of labor, environmental, and other civil society groups in Canada. I also, as Laura mentioned, uh, worked with her on a research project around trade and gender equality, specifically looking at the Canadian government's progressive trade agenda. So I'm gonna wear both of those hats and, and try to pull from both of those experiences. First, I want to offer a few reflections on the role of civil society, as my fellow panelists have. Um, the role of civil society in shaping the North American integration agenda, specifically in the context of the recent NAFTA renegotiation. Uh, and I wanted to speak specifically to the, the coalition building that, again, is, has been touched on already today. Um, yeah, so from, in my perspective, from the outset of the renegotiations, civil society engagement was really rooted in um, and oriented towards collaboration. And of course, there's a long, a long and strong history of collaboration and, and solidarity across North America among civil society actors. Um, and, and so this is a much more brief history uh, of that. But in, in my view, and this was touched on earlier today, uh, I think much of the civil society engagement and coordination uh, was was kickstarted or catalyzed by the trinational meeting in Mexico City that's been mentioned uh, in 2017. Uh, and at that gathering, so it was, it was hosted or organized by our Mexican allies 
who invited civil society and social movement actors from across North America to gather in Mexico City. This was shortly after the renegotiation had been announced, and essentially they wanted to get folks together to put our heads together and figure out how is civil society going to respond, what might our approach be, those sorts of questions. And from the get-go, the consensus was that we needed to engage in solidarity and, and collaborative work um, that the only way that we were going to be successful in registering our demands or our concerns uh, regarding a renegotiation would be to form a united front. Um, and again, there, there's a strong history of this. Um, and, and knowing that we needed to combat the tendency to pit workers and communities against one another, especially in the context of trade agreements and trade negotiations, and in the North American context, we know that unfortunately there's a history uh, of, this, of this division and, and unfortunately of scapegoating Mexico in particular and me Mexican workers. And so at the meeting, and this was something that was referenced as well, we recognized that amongst specific organizations or networks, there were inevitably going to be different uh, specific approaches to the renegotiation or varying specific demands or priorities. Um, and, and that was okay. And we knew that we might not reconcile that, uh, but the effort was to to articulate and discuss what might be our common concerns or our shared values. And, and this um, was eventually written in a joint declaration. I think Angela mentioned this, um, identifying those common concerns and, and values. Um, and I think John mentioned something similar uh, from a previous previous era. And I think that reminds me of, of Laura's mention of, of the, or someone's mention of the cyclical nature uh, of, of civil society activism. And so this joint declaration really formed a foundational document that would then inform the work and the advocacy that we were doing. And even if organizations or groups chose to tackle different issues or take different positions or different approaches, uh, such as the more kind of radical versus reformist debate that was referenced, um, this would serve as sort of a unifying document that we could come back to. Um, and I think that was really valuable. The gathering also kick-started uh, a trinational network of communication um, this mostly took the form of a, uh, an email list serve as well as phone calls and, and uh, some meetings uh, that really allowed us to share updates and intel about the talks, share any research or analysis that was coming out about specific issues, as well as uh, actively coordinate on or share information about any planned initiatives or actions across the continent um, and when there were opportunities to do so to, to help organizations maybe plug into that work, um, but otherwise to at least amplify what was going on uh, in other regions. In Canada, uh, we formed a pan-Canadian coalition specifically around the NAFTA renegotiations. So this was to serve a similar purpose, uh, to keep us in touch and, and regularly commu communicating, uh, sharing updates and intel, and, and to, to plan any um, coordinated positions or initiatives. Uh, one of the main activities that we organized was a, a civil society summit in Ottawa in the fall of 2017, I believe, uh, to coincide with one of the rounds of negotiations here in Ottawa. Uh, and, and that was oriented towards doing some public education work as well as uh, a political action. I believe in Laura's presentation, there was a, a photo on the front with Sujata in it uh, from that event. Uh, and also to do more strategizing and coordination. So we inv invited folks from uh, across the US and, and Canada as well as Mexico. So a, a sort of a follow-up to that Mexico City gathering. Um, Overall, I think there was a, a sense, and this has been touched on already, there was a sense that the NAFTA renegotiation presented a real opening or opportunity uh, to what felt, like, what felt like an opportunity to influence the process. Um, I, from where I sit, I think civil society saw the renegotiation uh, as an opportunity to not only reform the specific deal or to make improvements on the text, but to really rethink the model that we have for international trade. Uh, and not that this was necessarily a new position, uh, but it felt like maybe this was a, an opportunity to do that work. And in the Canadian context, the Trudeau government's progressive trade agenda and general progressive rhetoric uh, felt like there was more receptiveness to progressive ideas or progressive critiques uh, of NAFTA or, or, or the trade model. Uh, and, and also, as has been touched on, uh, this government was seemingly more uh, open and willing to engage in consultation and uh, uh, civil society um, or stakeholder engagement. Um, and so again, it felt like there was a real opening uh, or opportunity. Ultimately, I, I think we were, were disappointed with the outcome. 
and recognizing that the deal is not yet uh, finalized or, or ratified rather, but, um, and, and yeah, I won't, I won't touch on this because some of the uh, shortcomings or issues have been touched on already today. Um, though of course, uh, there were some notable wins, as Sujata mentioned, the elimination of energy proportionality, that clause, as well as the rollback of ISDS. Uh, while, while limited or, or not perfect, I think it's worth uh, acknowledging that civil society played a role in, in making that happen, um, and at least making it so that we're talking about these issues a little bit more. Um, notably though, even if the agreement isn't exactly what we were hoping for, one thing that I do want to stress, and this is something that we've been talking about around the TJN table, um, is that the work that civil society did, including folks in this room, uh, really helped to build some significant momentum during the NAFTA renegotiation. And so we saw more attention being paid uh, in the mainstream media or in political debates around trade issues, particularly in the North American context. We saw civil society and social movement actors helping to shift public opinion, while maybe not completely to where we would maybe like it to be. We did see more visibility uh, and attention being paid to progressive ideas or alternatives. And notably, we did see some cracks in the system, uh, particularly the, the rollback of ISDS comes to mind as, as something that, um, again, while imperfect, it, it, it illustrates a crack in the system that, that we can maybe pry open a little bit further. Uh, and so that's something that we're hoping to discuss a little bit more, how we might leverage or build on that progress. The other uh, thing that I wanted to speak to, that a question that had been posed to panelists, was what are the opportunities and obstacles for civil society to influence government and business agendas? So here I wanted to pull from some of the work that I'd done with Laura on, on trade and gender, specifically the progressive trade agenda, because I think it encapsulate, encapsulates some really interesting uh, opportunities as well as obstacles. Uh, so as I mentioned, the PTA seemed to present an opportunity or a space to engage in progressive ideas and to talk about alternatives. Uh, in terms of the gender dimension, uh, the Trudeau government, which has posed itself as a feminist government um, and, and committed to gender equality component of the PTA, it felt like there was a, an opportunity to maybe advance gender equality through trade policy um, or a broader policy agenda. And as part of the research project that we did, we interviewed folks uh, representatives from civil society groups, uh, and this was a, a common sentiment that we heard that there were, this was an opportunity to put forward proposals that would genuinely um, contribute to advancing gender equality. And so I won't go into detail here because this is documented elsewhere, but some of the things that we heard uh, in those interviews were that there was an opportunity to enact enforceable gender equity provisions, uh, as well as to allocate the appropriate amount of resources or funds to, to realize the stated goals. Um, in addition to that, uh, to engage in meaningful co consultation with experts, advocates, and the public with regards to, to gender, uh, to engage in de gender mainstreaming, so the application of a gender lens in the entirety of an agreement or throughout a policy-making agenda uh, rather than solely as a standalone gender chapter, and so this would be particularly important in areas like public services, uh, labor rights, environmental protection, food sovereignty, these sorts of things. And, and finally, um, there was a lot of discussion about the, the lack of analysis that had been done uh, within the government and otherwise regarding the gendered impacts of trade or um, how we might advance gender equality through trade policy. And so there was um, a lot of discussion about the need for applying a, an intersectional and gender-based analysis uh, to trade agreements as well as trade policy uh, in all aspects of the policymaking process. Um, so again, the PTA also represents an obstacle um, in the area of gender equity, uh, not only because um, we felt as though the, the outcome that we got in the USMCA or the CUSMA um, fell short on its stated goals regarding gender equity. Um, and so this is a, a challenge not only because uh, it fails to adequately address the gendered impacts of trade uh, in that it, it has some references to gender, but, but um, what I would argue is not a lot of substantive uh, change or, or uh, weight behind it. But this is also a challenge um, and this echoes, I think, what Laura was talking about with progressive neoliberalism, is that the progressive rhetoric maybe gives the illusion that gains have been made on these issues um, or, or that they've been addressed, uh, when, when in reality maybe that's not the case. Um, maybe we would argue that it's a co-optation of the language or simply symbolic commitments, that sort of thing. Um, but the other thing that I do want to mention is, I think, looking at where we're at today with the PTA, um, the Trudeau government has seemed to 
back away from the language of progressive trade or the progressive trade agenda in particular. Um, but that said, they've, we've already um, heard them make these commitments under the banner of progressive trade. Um, what comes to mind also is uh, the statements that Christia Freeland and others have made with regards to the rollback of ISDS uh, and kind of echoing some of the sentiments that civil society has long uh, been saying with regards to ISDS and its implications for public policy. And so I think there's an opportunity to hold them to those commitments and to those statements um, and, and to kind of use that as a, as a new opening perhaps uh, to push for progressive alternatives uh, or, or substantive changes. Um, and finally, just a couple other general obstacles that I would uh, touch on with regards to civil society engagement. One thing that we've heard, uh, we heard in our interviews with civil society reps, but also something that we've seen in the Trade Justice Network and with our allies uh, is the, the lack of, or the challenge of, of capacity uh, and resources um, is, is constantly a barrier. And um, that was something that we heard in our interviews with regards to the women's movement and other progressive movements uh, over time, such as compared to the original NAFTA talks. Um, and also the one thing that we heard a lot about was the, the challenge of organizing or maybe engaging with the public. Um, someone described it as the amorphousness of trade. Uh, so this idea that if trade agreements can feel very abstract or separate um, and these complex legal documents that um, have no bearing on our day-to-day -day life, whereas we know that, that they do. And so trying to, to communicate that in a way that's accessible and digestible uh, is a challenge. Um, especially in the, in the Canadian context, where as folks have talked about today, uh, trade or NAFTA was seen as something just kind of taken for granted or even as an inherent positive. And so I think those are things that we need to, to figure out how to tackle. Uh, so I'll leave it there for now. Um, and can maybe jump into other things in the questions period. Many thanks, Nadia. Well, we have uh, quite a bit of time for questions and uh, and suggestions, uh, maybe we can take a couple and then uh, we let our speakers respond. Yes, go ahead. Hi, Chris Roberts, CLC. Thanks so much for excellent presentations all there. It's a terrific panel. I've, I've been tr struggling with how to understand the relationship between um, what I think Natty referred to and what uh, Laura introduced earlier as progressive neoliberalism or left neoliberalism. And, the way in which labor in particular, but maybe other actors, have, have been integrated into the state's project in a different way in this round of, of trade neg negotiation than, than previously, and transnationalism. I mean, we're, we're in a moment when economic nationalism, political nationalism as a project of the right is capturing more of the working class, I think, in Canada, in the United States, other countries around the world. There's a political realignment of labor going on. And um, the ability of, 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 of you know, traditional vehicles for the working class, the trade unions, uh, the labor movement, to articulate that sentiment into a, into a, a true transnationalism it seems to me to be um, complicated by this progressive neoliberalism and the way that it has integrated uh, quite effectively, I think, the, the, the organizations of the labor movement in particular. So uh, it, it's, it's a complicated question, but I'm just struck by what Angelo said about you know, the, the previous fights where you had hundreds of thousands of workers mobilized with a, maybe a different vision of, of, of what trade policy should be, and it had a, it exerted pressure on the state in a way that, that we're not seeing, I think, in, in the current moment as, as explaining why labor has all of these openings uh, with the Canadian state and, and with the, the Republican administration in the US. So I guess I, if, if that makes sense at all, if you could say something about how to understand the, 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 the effort to, to construct a new transnational solidarity continentally at the same time as we're being pulled into this relationship, which is awkward with, with neoliberal states Thank you. Please. Okay, well, I, I feel like my question is somewhat different, so hopefully we'll be able to unpack all of this. Um, so 
Um, my name is Christiana, by the way. Uh, I asked a question earlier. So <laughs> uh, I was just wondering if, if you could all kind of provide your perspective, um, your own or your organization's perspective on um, what what civil society, um, what like people and organizations that advocate for civil society like rights should do to address um, sort of the contempt that they often face. Because I find that a lot of the times um, people that are that advocate that are very very active advocates for civil society and for the rights of the common people are not seen as heroes until after their time. And a lot of times like <laughs> while they're you know doing their thing, everybody just thinks that they're like the most annoying individual on the face <laughs> of the planet. And uh, and that can be very discouraging for people who are looking to maybe become advocates um, and don't want to get everybody hating on them. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could provide some insight on how you personally address that within your organization or as a as an individual, and um, yeah, so that's pretty much the gist of it um, for me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I take a different tack. I think civil societies can sometimes be a thorn in the neck. Um, I'm going to give you some figures. Canada is considered to be the worst polluter in terms of greenhouse gas production per capita, 25 tons per individual. India is considered to be one of the lowest at three tons of greenhouse gas production per individual. Greenhouse reduction per capita is the wrong metric. We are being taken in North America, especially in Canada, for a, a very rough ride. Unless you multiply the per capita greenhouse production per capita by the population density, it is totally meaningless. If you do that, Canada comes out smelling like roses at 85 tons per square kilometer. Europe at 1,000, Europe is 90, 928. Europe is saying that we are the best people who are looking after climate change. We want to reverse climate change. And what we want to do is decrease the per capita greenhouse reduction. That's, that's going to play against us. Canada's economy has been hobbled by a misunderstanding. Please take that into consideration. Do something about it. When we clamor about the change in climate, we have to talk about the proper figure. If we don't do that, these organizations, the civil organization, are doing a disservice to us. And President Trump is saying the right thing, but he doesn't know how to articulate it. That's his problem. Otherwise, his policies are actually quite sound. So I ask you, what is to be done in the future about these civil societies that are raising such a red flag but are not really telling us the right story? Thanks. Thank you. Um, we can go in any order you prefer to take the questions and comments you have received. Go ahead. <clears throat> Just a, a quick, quick sort of footnote to answer to uh, Chris's question about uh, transnationalism. One of the things that didn't happen, but sort of came up as an idea around um, the NAFTA process toward the end, was an initiative, I think, by Congressman David Bonnier, who I guess was from Ohio, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which got some response from Lloyd Axworthy on the Canadian side which was basically an extension of the European model. That is that you create an overall rights agreement for the continent um, protecting labor rights, but other rights as well, which might even include environmental rights, although I'm not sure that was a theme at the time, which would provide a framework, uh, in a sense, for, for transnational governance, but also for transnational organizing. Uh, as I recall, that uh, had a very brief half-life and disappeared because the uh, position of the three governments, in particular of Canada and the United States, was we're not talking about governance, we're just talking about trade. Yeah, I, I'm very interested in the development of the whole progressive trade agreement um, uh, because it, it's very interesting because I think um, 
one of the things you, I, I did a lot of organizing um, on the CETA file in Europe. Um, and so what, ha what you saw happening in Europe is that there was a large amount of people who were basically 300,000 people went on the street to protest uh, against CETA and TTIP at, at a certain point. Um, and what you saw, it, what I think happened at that point is there were two different things that were going on. It was the growth of, of the populace. Like on the one hand, you had, um, when you got to the United States election, for example, you had the Trans-Pacific Partnership and basically everybody from Trump to Hillary Clinton um, basically um, you basically criticized the agreement. So, it, and, and then you had in the CETA context where the CETA and TTIP were, were becoming very almost toxic and poisonous daily, um, both from the, the fairly the right wing, which is Trump and the Le Pens and, and, and so on, um, often using the same rhetoric of, of the left, um, saying that, you know, I, I just was watching um, a speech by Bannon where he talks about the deplorables and he talks about all the people who are left out of trade. So, so at one point, you see that trade is becoming toxic on, on an international level, both from the, uh, the resurgence of the, the right and the resurgence of the left. Um, and so Canada, within this context, is, is trying is working on on CETA, and they're trying to say, well, how do we how do we make this work? And you know, well, we're, we're a progressive government, so we think we are anyway. So we're going to come up with this whole thing of how do we sell, we sell neoliberalism, and that's um, this whole. Um, progressive trade agreement, basically, that, that we're going to do things um, as if, you know, we're, we're doing that. So for Europe, we're going to have this whole interpretive clause that's going to, like, interpretive dance that's going to talk about our values. And then we're going to go to the U.S. and we're going to do these gender clause things. Uh, we're, we're gonna, so, and, but it's, it's, it's absolutely un, uncoordinated. There's no rhyme or reason to, to why, you know, for example, in CETA we have um, investor state and we think it's okay within the European context, but in NAFTA, we, we're happy that we got rid of it. Um, we want gender, we want like, um, we didn't get our gender or, 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 or indigenous clauses somehow, but somehow it's progressive. So we want progressive CETA and progressive NAFTA, because we can be progressive when we're in Europe, we'll go around and say we have progressive values, then we'll go to the US and say, oh yeah, we have the same progressive values. Trump, you, you know, there, there's some point, progressive has to actually mean something. Um, and um, and that's the other thing too. I mean, there's a lot of people who talk about these NAFTA agreements, like we've had this amazing amount of consultation. Well, it depends on who you are within the consultation process. If you are a stakeholder, like you're in an industry that actually has uh, a NAFTA effect, then, then you have a, a closer relationship. And I understand that. that, that makes a lot of sense. But often the other, consul the other part of consultation was you know, showing up and talking. Um, in Europe, they had talked about the idea of having um, something we all tried to bring to Canada was one, uh, one negotiating round with civil society. That was something that was on the agenda, and that never happened because, in the North American context, it w it wasn't it wasn't going to be likely. And so it, it's really interesting because we talk. I, I was just really interested in the things you were saying because, at some point how we get along and how we relate in civil society has a lot to do with what our power is vis-a-vis -vis the states that we're dealing with. So in Europe, they had a lot of power because they are you know, mostly Western European countries, lots of money, lots of, um, they're taken seriously within their governments. Um, they have um, the ability to, to go to each other quickly. They're used to, they have a European Union um, who supports them a lot. So they have a lot of power um, within there to, to make changes, and they are heard, and they are put within the process. Um, there's some differences with Central Europe, which has less less of a you know an, an infrastructure, but generally they're they're fairly even. You come to the to the Americas and to North America, we're in a situation where there's huge imbalances of power, where civil society is, is not really like you know everyone was coming to us. Like and it was very ironic because in the European context, they're all saying, "Oh well, Canada, we're we're not as progressive as the Europeans. Please, please help us out." But here in the North American context, the Americans are, and Mexicans are coming up to us and goes, "You have the most progressive government. Please help us out." And we're like, oh no, oh, yes, your government's so progressive. Justin Trudeau, he's so progressive. I'm like, oh boy, we're dead. Um, and and then you also have the problems of capacity differences, like the difference of, I mean, within the center of the negotiation, the, the government that did have the most power was the U.S. I mean, even now, like all the negotiating rounds were in the U.S. Even now, we we in our ratification processes are going to be able to have 
very little effect unless we, we go to, to Washington. So that's that's also part of it. I mean, especially I think one of the tricky parts uh, also was language. We don't have the same when we say besides English Canada and and I mean Mexico the level of English is not is not as high as you know within the European Union. Um, there's less capacity for them in terms of financially. We can't just fly like. In Europe, we can just go and meet each other and show up at all the negotiating rounds. We don't have that the, those economies. Like I, besides some of the unions, um, I I wasn't able to follow all the negotiating rounds. And har and I'm one of the more wealthier organizations within civil society. So that that's part of that is part of the, the whole capacity issue of how you know. And so without those fundamental supports being given to civil society. Um, the idea of, of, of trans, you know, national solidarity is kind of meaningless. Those are the important things that need to be, you know, thought into. I mean, the governments have to give us the, the capacity as well, not just, oh, we'll listen to you and we'll, you can't kind of show up to the, 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 the rounds, you're not in the negotiations, you're not there, and then we'll just we'll kind of listen to you. We have to be, you know, put in the process and given that, that capacity as well. Um, because business is there. They're, they're all over the place. They're just flying around. They're on the cocktails. They're doing this. They have access. We as civil society are, are coming in afterwards. And about the point about being annoying. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> um, yeah, it is a problem. And because why we, um, often I'm asked, like, you're here and you're not talking about the economy. You're not talking about industry. Why, why is it that you as civil society have, have any right to be here? Um, it's funny because I was looking at um, past articles about Maud Barlow during the, the our, our spokesperson during the multilateral agreement on investment. Um, and there was a lot of, oh, the articles are horrible that she's crazy, she's uninformed, she's this. And, and the MEI is not, is not, doesn't exist anymore. Um, because basically um, a piece of, uh, it was leaked to the Council of Canadians at that time and that was one of the things that actually got rid of the, uh, the agreement. I mean, um, I think that in terms of civil society, um, I think that there's a, an, an aspect that the economy and somehow us, we're kind of different. This, the economy is important, we're not really important. Um, but uh, there is no functioning economy without the environment. There is no functioning, I mean, and this whole trade system does not work. If more and more people find themselves completely out, outside of the trade system, this whole thing come, falls apart. Um, and I, I think the, the big challenges of our society, um, environmental change, inequality, um, what the future of work is, um, those conversations have got to start, you know, if, if we're going to have any society at all, those, those conversations have got to start happening now. Thank you. I, uh, just a quick story. Just when you talked about the uh, European Union and the and the uh, civil society organizations, there was a meeting at the CLC. I don't know, Angela, Angela was there at this meeting. It was, I, I was on conference call, but they, we were sitting there, you know, with them, and uh, it's like we're talking, you know, civil society unions to unions, and they, they were they were the, the question of the day was, how do we uh, make the best out of a bad situation? This deal is getting passed. Um, how do we uh, ramp up the level of obligation and enforcement and, and all of this with respect to the labor chapter? And so, I mean, there, there's a big story behind that, but um, the, the comment that was made by, I think, the chair of the committee to us was like, well, just tell your government. And it's like, you want, like, we want to knock on the door to the Ministry of Labor during the Harper government and say, hey, we, we want to talk to you about something. It's like, it, it doesn't work that way. It's, it, that's not how it is here. Uh, and so th there's also, uh, you know, understanding uh, the nuances of, of, of different uh, uh, politics, I guess. But um, I, I'll go back to Chris's point. I, 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 strugg I, I struggled with this. I think this requires a lot more uh, heavy thinking, I, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, I, the, the concept of progressive neoliberalism, I, 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 you know, I, I think I understand kind of what that means. It, 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 in some ways, I think it, it's easily understood as, as being able you know, to create progressive outcomes in a situation of, of uh, free market economics and deregulation. I think in some ways, this is kind of how, what we do every single day at the bargaining table is trying to, trying to make progressive an inherently unprogressive thing. So uh, to, to what degree that, that you know, uh, encapsulates you know, the inherent contradictions of of where we are in 2019 on trade versus where we were in 1993. I think there, there's a lot more, you know, muddiness to that. So probably needs to be kind of sorted out. Um, but you mentioned about 1993, and, and I, I just, that's the first thing I started reflecting on. 
And uh, I certainly was, I, I was around, I just wasn't physically there on Parliament Hill. Um, but I was listening to Nirvana or something like that back <laughs> in high school. Um, but I, I don't, you, you may have just said this in passing, but the way you, you framed it was that there, in 1993, you got 100,000 people on the Hill, and these people possibly have a different vision of what is to be, right? And, 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 and I don't know if it was some sort of heightened social awareness or, or consciousness around the neoliberal project and its failings, or this was something new, like this idea of free trade, and we were scared and we wanted it to, to stay the way it was. And, and other people who were around can maybe give me the Coles notes of the actual, you know, ver beyond the rhetoric, beyond the headlines, what actually was driving the popular movement. And if I'm, if I'm going to try to take my lessons from today, day to day, and try to import them back in time, that's what drives us a lot today is fear about like, oh my God, this is new, this is different. Uh, we can't have that. Well, what do you want? I just want it the way it is right now. And, and I, I worry about a kind of, a, you know, reclaiming history in some sort of heightened awareness thing, because I, I, I would guess that that's maybe what was driving this more uh, at that time. The other thing I, I want to say, too, in the context of what is progressive neoliberalism and what it means for this discussion, is, you know, Unifor has been spending the last uh, year and a half, and I know we've, we've partnered with uh, the Council of Canadians in certain cases, uh, hosting uh, public town halls, talking to workers, talking to anybody who wants to listen to us about trade. And one of the lessons that we try to impart and remind our members is that even just talking about trade is complicated because trade and these free trade agreements and all of the stuff embedded in them and the objectives they're trying to achieve, like they're not the same thing. We, we've been trading with people for a long time. We've supercharged our trade relationship through neoliberal objectives and, and, and you know, putting deregulatory measures and things within these agreements. That's not necessarily what trade is. And the more we conflate these two concepts, the more difficult it is to think alternatively because you think, well, the alternative is no, rip those things up and we're just gonna, we're gonna go into our caves and we're gonna figure out what we're gonna, like it's, it's more than that. And I, and I think that's part of how we, we move forward in contemplating what a 21st century project of progressive economic nationalism, how that looks in a globalized transnational context. I think it, it has to start from these demystification exercises about, about some, some of these pieces. The other thing about, and maybe the last thing on, on this piece, is around uh, the, the whole where we stand on questions of economic nationalism. I mean, when Trump was elected, even when he was working his way through the process of being elected, you, you listen to him. I have a copy of a speech he gave in Pennsylvania. I swear to God, I think it was a speech given by Buzz Hargrove. Like, like you know, it, 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 was, it was basically riffing off everything we've said for 25 years about the economy, about trade, about workers. It was just coming from someone who had a fundamentally different agenda. And so this has created, I, I forget who mentioned it, but someone creating tensions for the US labor movement because I think part of them is like, oh my God, he's saying what we've said. We have resolutions passed at conventions saying what he is saying, but we can't support this guy because there's other factors at play. And so it's getting them into a bit of a pretzel. When the same thing here, to a lesser degree, where we are, we've been talking about economic nationalism, we've been trying to nuance that whole line of thinking for a long time, but now when you do it, you, you, you gotta be careful because we start playing into even crops of our membership who are showing up to rallies wearing yellow vests now and, and wearing, waving uniform flags. Like, that is a slippery slope. And um, I guess it's a pitfall of trying to build a popular movement, but trying to be inclusive with as many different progressive concepts, whereas other people, in some other cases, it's very simple. It's me, not them. That's it, done. And if you can fuel that narrative, I'm good, I'm with you. And, and that goes to maybe the last point that you had made about, um, you know, maybe we are annoying. I, I sometimes I feel like I'm annoying. Um, but uh, civil society and, and our gaining traction. Um, I think it's about how you see yourselves reflected in what the civil society organizations are trying to portray. And, uh, and I think we are inherently against the mainstream. And that makes it more difficult for people to just naturally gravitate into what we're doing. 
Um, uh, if you ask that same question to a group of union members, I think the answer would be like, we need more TV ads or something like this. It, it, but it's so, so fundamentally deeper in terms of how uh, people can uh, can see themselves reflected. And um, yeah, anyways, that's that's a not just a, another panel, but maybe another week long session of, of <laughs> conversations we should have. Um, so. And maybe just on the point of this thorn in our side, I, I don't, I don't want to speak to, I don't think I have any authority to speak to this question around um, how we talk about greenhouse gas emissions and all that, although I think the points you've raised are, are pretty provoking and, and I, I, certainly uh, sparking my thoughts. But um, us being a thorn in someone's side in some ways, even though we wouldn't say that outright, I, I think that's kind of our job in some ways because the, the side we are trying to be a thorn in is, is sort of a mainstream vision of the, the economy, the way that it's working, and it doesn't always work for other people. Hence, groups form in protest to that mainstream concept. So if we're there not being a thorn in that side, you don't need, then that means everything is in pure utopia. I think that's maybe a value of us being uh, equal parts annoying and equal parts uh, frustrating. But anyways, just my thought. This is a very fun panel. At least for me. I am used to very boring panels. Uh, I like it. Um, any, uh, please, any more questions, comments? Yeah, um, thank you. It was a great panel. And I just want to say that I'm probably maybe more optimistic now after hearing you, uh, Angelo, about maybe what, how we, what we were able to accomplish and how we shifted the narrative away from potentially uh, racist uh, tropes and instead broadly supported. Uh, Mexican workers, and that that was that was very useful. And and Nadia, in terms of building uh, allegiances and networks that maybe will continue on and continue to be useful. Um, so one of one of the reasons I think labor reacted the way that they did this time was because they didn't see those millions of people on the hill or whatever it was, thousands of people on the hill, as having. Um, I'm exaggerating. It's Trump, right? Well, like how many people you, came to the. Yeah, um, and those those people in the hill as having won anything, they feel like that lost, and that that they um, they didn't they didn't achieve their goal. So we needed to try something different. Um, and so, what would you say, think now, even though it's not we're not done? What lessons do you have for how we might approach it next time? And how do you think we're how will we how should we continue the networks that we've built? Oh, and I think we should just embrace our inner commudgeons. We should be a thorn in the side. I presented to a Senate committee on trade, and one of the senators, is, he's like, oh, scoffed at me. You're out on a nice flow. But it makes us stronger, because you have to do your research and know your stuff and, and know what you're talking about to be solid on what you're saying. Thank you. Uh, first of all, my apologies to Nadia. I know you had uh, maybe some responses to the previous round, so maybe you want to begin with that. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I don't know that I have any immediate thoughts on, on Angela's question. I might need to, to chew on that a bit. Um, but sure, um, regarding Chris's question about progressive neoliberalism, um, I liked what Angelo said about this challenge of making progressive something that's inherently unprogressive or an, an inherently unprogressive thing. Um, and I think the, the Canadian government's trade agenda um, represents that really nicely. Um, I think it was also Angela that maybe was talking about the evolution of this agenda and, and how it kind of was something that they stumbled into and maybe wasn't um, a, a conscious effort to outline this comprehensive agenda, but rather kind of they got stuck um, in a few different situations that then they had to kind of backpedal and say, okay, well, sure, this is a comprehensive policy package or, or agenda. Um, and so anyways, I think um, it, it's an interesting sort of case study or example of, of where we're at. Um, and, and like I said before, I think even if the way that it came about was maybe disingenuine or reactionary or unintentional at least, uh, I think there's an opportunity to, to hold them to that um, and, and to call for genuine, genuinely progressive um, alternatives um, or changes. Uh, and also on the question about uh, the, the perceptions, let's say, of, of civil society, um, I don't know that I have any um, great insights um, and, and the Trade Justice Network isn't um, always engaging with people directly because we're kind of a network of organizations. So uh, I know that I'm not the best position to speak to this, but um, I do think that um, it was mentioned the, the work that uh, Unifor and, and the Council of Canadians have done with the, the, is it the People's Trade 
process, is that what it's called, under the banner. Um, and so yeah, I think that also um, speaks to the type of work that we need to be doing in terms of meeting people where they're at, um, and whether that's doing some educational work, but also learning uh, about the experiences uh, of communities and people, and, and to, to have frank conversations about what's been happening, as well as to pick one another's brains about where we might go. Um, and yeah, I just think that idea of meeting people where they're at, um, as opposed to always it being the same group of us in a room kind of talking about the same sorts of critiques or, or ideas, um, I think that that isn't necessarily going to either get us where we want to go or, or change perceptions of what we're doing. Um, so yeah, just some, some initial thoughts. But I think these are all great and, and big questions to, to chew on. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there for now. I can start. Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's an excellent, um, excellent question, and and I'm happy to uh, you know we'll chat further. I think this is the right conversation that we have to have now, right? As, as a movement. Um, uh, so, cu a couple of things. Yeah, uh, you know, from where we were in uh, 1994, uh, when this was all done, there there may have been uh, a degree of uh, defeat, a uh, feeling of defeat, and then that might help explain what what uh, transpired. Um, but th there, you know, boy, I, I have to be careful how I say this um, because we were. I mean, we were right. We we have been right about what happens when you give transnational corporations the ability and the flexibility to extend supply chains to every corner of the world and allow them to more seamlessly move things across borders, you're going to see work progressively move to places where people can do things cheaper. And as technology, uh, technology has advanced, it's made countries that historically have not had the capacity to do certain work, they can now do that. And, and the, market, the labor market for, for competition and all this is expanded. We were right, and we saw the effects of that. Um, but you know, re reading through a lot of the other materials that we produced, it wasn't just about trying to paint a picture of what happens in, in this scenario. We were saying a lot of things. There was a lot of, of, of things we were saying that we were going to lose, that Canada would be taken over, we would be, you know, it, it, was, it was like off the charts. And I, I've, I've had material that was produced in 1993 that says this. And so part of me, I remember reading one chapter of it. It, I, it was written by the CAW at the time, UAW, and it was, I said, uh, if we pass NAFTA, this will happen to the auto pact. And it's like, boom, that's exactly what happened. They dismantled it because they had new tools to do that. But in other case, we will lose all public services. OK, uh, so we, like, that didn't happen like that. But there's other pressures that have created. But it was like, oh my god, we're going to lose our culture. We're going to lose Canada. And so the popularization of the approach 25 years later, it's like, we, we didn't really do, like that didn't really happen. Bad things happen, but not, not as bad as what we, and so um, I think there are still people who see it as nuanced as most of us do, you know, that, that we did lose in a lot of cases. But the average person who might have said, yeah, I don't want this, they might think, well, okay, well, now we've had 25 years of it, and whatever, like, I don't know, it's not that bad. Like, that could also be part of why there isn't a groundswell of of um, of anger around these things. So again, I, I I don't know what it is, but maybe it's our fault. Maybe we just didn't do a good job of sustaining. Not, not yeah, right, 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 right. So, uh, anyways, I'll finish. I want to hear. I know you have a lot of the things to say about it. Anyways, I'm just. So the other thing, your question more specifically is like, what do we do the next time? What does the next time look like? And that is an excellent question. The only, I, I don't know what it is. I think it's like, uh, you know the. It seems like the NAFTA gave us a platform that we didn't have because I don't know that a lot of people are paying attention to, including the media, what's going on with the Pacific Alliance trade agreements or Mercosur trade agreements. It's it's not as impactful, I guess, on us uh, as NAFTA is. So I imagine unless we're going to again renegotiate NAFTA or have some crazy conception of a new multilateral agreement that's so damaging, there might not be the same amount of oxygen that we can, you know, suck in or, or whatever. But I think what it might do is if we can frame some of the victories that we've had, we now have new platforms to criticize and challenge and say, 
there are different ways of doing this, uh, and you're not doing them. And look, because we did create new market access restrictions for auto. Why can't we do that in all sectors? Why, why doesn't, they, you know, don't tell us it can't be done because it's done. So it's, it's new ways of frustrating the model that I don't know we had before because, same as you, being at these trade committees, it, it, you know, endlessly, it's like, well, what do you think we should do, Mr. DeCaro? What, what's the, and it's like, well, uh, we had the auto pact in the 1960s, so maybe we can do that again. And it's like, we can, but th that's all we got. Like, that's, that's all I've got to work with. Or some different vision that I can't quite articulate of a new world that we need to start building, which is great, but I don't know how to explain that to a committee. So this gives us new mechanisms to say, no, we shouldn't have ISDS, because look what, look what the minister said just last week or whatever. We can do that. Uh, so I think that helps us. And then on the, on the go forward thing too, um, I, I think our job, as I said in my remarks, is about uh, making sure we're doing what we can to try and work in solidarity, especially with Mexican workers, uh, to try and elevate those standards, frustrate their model that's created a lot of distortions in, in anti-competitive behavior uh, across supply chains. And when we do have victories, we have to magnify them. And one thing we learned, and I, you know, I've been to Mexico City four times uh, in the last year. And uh, again, NAFTA gave us the platform and Jerry had the microphone and he would talk about it. But it, it, when we talked to our Mexican allies, we were very careful to say to them, look, we want to help you, but we don't want this to seem like we're swooping in here. The rich Canadian union guy is going to tell you how to fix your problems. That, that's not what we want. And they were, they were appreciative of our acknowledgement of that, but they also told us, we don't have a platform. So when you show up here and do this, you're, you're creating something that wouldn't exist if you didn't. And I think that was a lesson too, a humbling lesson to say, they need us and we have to do what we can to, and I think that's what meaningful solidarity looks like. And I think we got a lot of work to do if we wanna make that happen, or we can simply kind of quiet down and retrench and then it just, it's another lost opportunity. So I think in anyways, in, in those ways, I, that's how I would respond. Um, it's, it's, I'm always sitting there in my mind thinking, how is it possible? Um, it used to be, um, what Maude says all the time, that Canada used to be in the 1980s at the forefront of what was trade. We were the center of the world when it came to talking about trade. Um, and now, um, when you look at what's what's going on, I mean, there's an there's an appetite that's very much global, and anti-trade, and it just doesn't seem to be happening in Canada, and so it, it's really strange too because on the one hand, we as it's also something that we as progressives have been talking about for you know decades and decades and decades, the free trade of the Americas, the the WTO protests, and uh, I mean the WTO protests was it was very interesting too because it wasn't um, the usual suspects, they were very young people, um, very you know, people that might my age at that time, <laughs> in, their in their 20s, and it was a very, you know, and that was, and it was very much, you know, like it was the, the whole no logo thing, the whole globalization. So how did this movement all of a sudden become Bannon's thing, or, or Trump's thing, or Le Pen's thing, or where did that happen? Like, what did we do where we stopped capturing people's imaginations, where people just kind of thought, okay, this, that's them again, this is repetitive, this is boring, we've heard it all again. I mean, I, I was just looking at um, you know, the 1930s and how a lot of progressive movements at that time were doing really well, and then basically all of these uh, right-wing movements took all their language, basically, and, and, and pulled it out. And so I think we're going through, through that again. On the one hand, um, all the issues that we have to talk about, they're more relevant than they've ever been. At, you know, they're, they're, you know, 50 people own like half most of the wealth of the planet. Um, everybody feels they're in precarious jobs. We may not have any jobs, Robert. Robots are going to do it. They're going to come back to Canada, but apparently robots will do our jobs. So, so we, we won't need work because we'll be post work. We'll all have, you know, guaranteed incomes. I don't know how, but I mean, the, the, is, the issues that we have here, uh, climate change, I mean, these are, these are the issues that, that we need to be talking about right now here in Canada. And what I, I, I do think, and maybe at this point, 
Um, we need the help of our, our American allies. I was just reading something about how um, trade is going to be really hot in, in the next um, election, some people are saying, the next US election, because from the right, from the Republicans, and um, NAFTA, and, and from the left, left is not po popular. So how do we, as Canadians, maybe import that? Like, that's something I've been thinking about. Like, how do we get Europeans over? How do we get Americans over? How do we bring that so we reinvigorate our discourse and also renew it? Because, I mean, we can't be talking about our, our social programs have all gone. I mean, no, I mean, we have to have a very much more nuanced analysis of, of where trade is now. And I think, um, I, I think that one thing Angela was saying about how often we're being reactive we're always reacting to these trade agreements that come, whether it's NAFTA, and we have to be because people only care about what we, as trade trade nerds, people only care about us when it's in the news. So, and they only care about it when it's when Trump says something. So we have to be there. But at some level, I mean, I think we we do have to start thinking about the mechanism of a completely different trade, world trade order. I mean, one of the reasons why people are going to nationalism is that's the only place where we have a state. That's the only place we can regulate. That's the only place we the, there is any democracy. There is no democracy at an international level. There's only the market and a market that we're we're we're, we're making more and more um, more and more corporate corporate captured. So how do we make those mechanisms that are going to go beyond you know beyond that? Um, in, within trade? How do we make those international mechanisms where we actually do have power? And I think trade agreements might be part of, 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 that, of that, that thing, but we have to actually create that mechanism. What does that mean legally? What does that mean economically? How do we create sanctions where if someone violates environmental or labor laws, we can sanction them? Like, can we think about things at a global level that, that, that could be very interesting? And I, and I think, like, what will we do next time? Um, I mean, there's a lot of, th I mean, one of the things we have, we learn is from solidarity, but solidarity means that we also have to have the ability, the financial ability, the, I mean, what we did in Europe, we had a lot of research, we had a lot of concrete actions. Um, I find sometimes that um, as a trade movement, we're often an analyzing and we're talking and consoling each other about how, just how nobody understands us. But often I think that sometimes we have to think about concrete actions or how do we use moments, like in Mexico City, for example, how do we use movement that to do political action? And I find sometimes because we're in, trade is so theoretical, it's so abstract, that often we're all in the abstract and we're not thinking, I mean, how do we, we make this a, a polit into political action? And, and that's the step that um, we all need to think about, how, to, how do we work that out? Um, I mean, I, I really loved working with the Europeans because there was always action, there was always communication, there was always like strategy, whereas in the North American context, we never, everyone sort of, I guess we're, American, we're North Americans, we kind of go to our own. So we never really had that, you know, what's the next step? So how do we monkey wrench this? How do we, you know, how do we get into that? Like, and, and, and I think those are the ways that we need to do. We have to have an imagination of a, of a project. We need to be able to get other people to share our imagination. And we also have to make it work. We have to bring the actions together to do that. And, and that, I think, is unions, labor, environmental groups, everyone has to be thinking about how do we make this into a, a political project? Thank you very much. Um, I know that we are past time. I don't know if Laura, you want to add some uh, closing remarks. Uh, also, John and Nadia, if you wanted to add uh, a few more words afterwards. Sure, I, just a quick comment, really not really a question. Thank you so much, this is a great discussion. Um, so exciting to be able to organize this like a <laughs> Christmas day all over again to have people I really want to hear from speaking like this. Um, I would just wanted to pick up on a couple of points John made uh, at the beginning about lessons from the past. One point you made was about research and academics, and Sujata just mentioned research, but I think it's not been so much linked to uh, university research, and that's a problem on both sides. The academics haven't been doing that, but whereas... Um, so I think we need to find new ways to do that, and it's certainly if you look at you know, the neoliberal side, one reason why neoliberals have been so successful is they've, they have such a strong body of stormtroopers who are out there selling this agenda, you know, developing models, and, and, uh, and they're very much linked to, the, to university and think tank um, uh, workers, that, and that really helps them consolidate that agenda, and I don't think the left really has that. 
Um, and another point was resources. Um, uh, there was sort of a tone of sort of beating yourselves up that you haven't done as much as in the 90s. Um, well, one thing that happened in between was neoliberalism and the cuts to uh, civil society organizations. Um, people used to talk about, um, you know, Jane Jensen and um, Susan Phillips wrote fabulous work about citizenship re regimes in Canada and how those were restructured under both the Martin and, and Harper governments. Well, they weren't write, writing about Harper yet, just even under Martin. Um, there were so many cuts to civil society organizations, and we saw this particularly in the case of the, the women's movement that, you know, st st uh, status of women, National Commission on, what's it called? Yeah. National Committee on the Status of Women had substantial resources coming to it, and it could do real work because of that. Um, and similarly in labor, you know, there used to be substantial funding for international solidarity work that came through CETA. Um, and uh, that was cut, cut. There were so many cuts to civil society organizations. So it's not just, you know, you haven't done a good job, but um, the resources aren't there that used to be. But also I just really appreciated what Ang Angelo was saying about the need for uh, providing that kind of solidarity. I mean, we you still have some resources compared to Mexican unions and, and now it is a really propitious moment, I think. Um, we do have allies in the, in the government now. Um, the labor minister is the daughter of old-time Remalk uh, activist, Berta Lujan, um, and our, our, se llama? Arturo Alcalde, no? Um, so there's a long history right there in the Mexican government. They're now in government, and that could change a lot of things, uh, even if there are some limitations to, what, to aspects of the new government's agenda. So some rambling comments, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I, I came late. I don't know, Laura, if you have any closing remarks for uh, the day or <laughs> something. <laughs> but uh, otherwise. Say or? Uh, no, good. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Uh, it was a great Christmas day all over again. <laughs> Certainly the weather's not shifted much since Christmas, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll just keep going. <laughs> Um, uh, so I really appreciate, this, especially this last panel, to get civil society people here to give us their ideas from the grassroots, and uh, we'll go on and think more about these issues in coming days. So thanks a lot. Thank you.